I just think Bitcoin could be one of those things that kind of helps bring people together, kind of align a lot of just goals, I think, for the next generation. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. I'm Jarrett, and on this episode, I get to sit down with Becca Bratcher, who is a Bitcoiner, an author, a wife, I believe a mother, I believe you and Lee have some children, and she joins us today, and we're going to talk about her book, 21 Women in Bitcoin, and we'll probably talk about a whole host of other things, but clearly that's uh, something that that's on the menu. So uh, Becca, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me here today. Absolutely. Very excited to talk. As I showed you before I pressed record, I have chopped up your book. I have a lot of things to talk about. I, I think every single story was unique. And one of the things that was interesting, and I also listened to you on the uh, Progressive Bitcoiner with Trey, mm -hmm. who's also actually located in Massachusetts. I'm currently in Massachusetts. And he and I are definitely going to um, probably collab on something because, yeah, he's also doing media. One of the things that you said on that episode and something that you say at the end of the book, as well as I believe at the beginning of the book, was essentially that when the Gannon said, hey, Becca, you should write this book, 21 Women, 21, um, women in Bitcoin, you thought it was a joke. And so why did you think it was a joke? And how did you go from, you know, it being a joke to something that, you know, is now around the world? <laughs> yeah, well, if you know Billy, you know, he's just one of the like nicest guys, very jovial and he's very inclusive. He's always um, inviting us to, you know, random things that he's he's doing regarding Bitcoin. Um, and McKenna is just so much fun. And so I just thought like that is so nice of him to think about that. But there's no way anybody would read a book like that. Um, and then he sent me an email with a list of like, Hey, what if you did this and you could add this in and you could interview this woman. And so I was like, man, he's really serious. And, uh, Lee was like, yeah, I mean, I think you should, I think you should do it. I think it could be really cool. Um, and then I talked to a few other people who were like, yeah, I mean, I would totally read that or, um, I don't know. It just, it just kind of felt more like, okay, this is actually something that is not on the market yet. That could be really useful. Um, and obviously I feel very strongly about it. So yeah, it just kind of became a reality. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I actually don't know the Gannons, but maybe one day I will meet them. And if I do, I'll be like, great job with that joke. Cause I think Becca did a great job. And then from there, I was just like, do you, you know, in the intro, I, I threw out some buzzwords, right? Bitcoiner, author, mother, wife, uh, somebody out in the world trying to make a difference. Do you identify now? as an author, like in the Bitcoin space or even outside the Bitcoin space, how has that kind of been for you? It's definitely a new title I'm getting used to saying. Um, I've done, you know, some writing the last several years um, and will continue to do that. So I really feel like I'm more of a, an article girl, I guess, if you will say, um, uh, more of a writer, but authors is fun. It's been a really great project to work on. Yeah, I, I ask you that selfishly because I was so curious because Starting this role at Compass being media and now running this podcast, I've been podcasting for about four years now, actually four years this summer, but I've only recently started to refer to myself as a podcaster, but it feels weird. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but it feels weird sometimes because I think maybe there's a stereotype of what a podcaster is and what a podcaster isn't. And that's where I'm just kind of, I don't know. Anyway, so I, I wanted to ask you that. And one of the things that is so central to your book is that the world, right? So many of the stories are about people who are either first generation or second generation who have come to the United States. And because they've come to the United States, they have come from a place that maybe wasn't as friendly for them. And so by the time they get to the United States, we have a couple examples of Poland, we have Russia, Cuba was an example that, that stuck out. There's many examples um, where people are now using Bitcoin in Africa for empowerment. But as far as the immigrant story, that seemed to really stick out. Was that something that you felt as you were writing this? Uh, was it something that you anticipated to have kind of been there when you dove into this project? Yeah, I've, one of the things that really uh, strikes me as unique about Bitcoin is how it varies from nation to nation. So in the U.S., um, 
typically it's seen as like a store of value, kind of like a gold type of uh, asset. But in um, parts of Africa, like Nigeria or Ghana, um, it's more of a lifeline. It's more than a currency. It's kind of like a, um, I don't know, just like a, a group or a movement that you're part of. And it means a lot. And the government's very aware of it. And just it just strikes me as unique because there aren't that many things, I feel like, um, in our day and age that vary so drastically being the same product um, globally. And so another thing that I don't talk about a lot, very often is um, growing up, I grew up in like a cultish environment. And I think not having control over certain aspects is just something that's not going to be a thing for me anymore. You know, once you're out of that and you realize that you can't have control and you can't have a say in what you um, participate in, it's just something that nobody's ever going to take away from you again. And so I think I resonated with these women in a, in a kind of a very, very small way um, in that matter. So I really wanted to highlight their stories um, as best I could. Yeah. I want to, one of the, I chopped up the book. Hopefully it's my copy and I'll share it with other people and they'll be like, wow, there's a lot of notes in the margin. Like yeah. It's a grad school book or something. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name, but Mackenzie Sigalos or Sigalos, she has something I want to read and it kind of builds on this. And then I would love for you to then talk to me about maybe other things since you've wrote, since you've written this book that you've kind of come across that maybe she would have added in here had we, you know, had, had that in, in hindsight. She says, I've spoken with Kenyan entrepreneurs who are using Bitcoin mining as a means to build our, out micro grids to electrify remote, remote villages with Ukrainians who have turned to digital currencies as a way to make ends meet while under attack by Russia, with Salvadorans about how they're adapting to the nationwide Bitcoin experiment, and with people on the ground in the once removed global financial hub of Lebanon who tell me that digital assets are the only stable currencies inside the war-torn country. Since she said this, uh, I wanted to know if you've come across other things, if people have reached out, if there's kind of other things internationally that you've stumbled across now, having put this book out, which is kind of like a beacon to, Hey, you're not alone. We're all in this movement. Um, yeah. I mean, there's constantly different parts of the world that are under attack or in turmoil, um, with their, you know, monetary policies that could totally be, um, using Bitcoin could be happening now. There's so many women who I wanted to get in this book who, um, either couldn't you know get a hold of or they declined, which is totally fine too. I know privacy is a very big deal. Um, but yeah, I mean, nobody has reached out since the book's been out. It hasn't been out that long. And um, you're very kind to even think that that many people have read it. But um, I think that it's there, we're only going to see more and more stories like this. Um, uh, you know, Venezuela is a good example of that. I know that they, a lot of Venezuelans have started using Bitcoin. Um, and it's just, it, it's so unique. And all of the stories that she mentioned, um, you can really take your life savings with you. Like, and nobody's going to take it away from you or, um, you know, steal from you in ways of uh, transferring money or like, I don't know. It's just, it's just so incredible for, I feel like, especially women who are mothers to um, raise their children in a, I don't know if safer environment is the right word to use or not, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like a different kind of perspective to have. Yeah. You mentioned that your childhood growing up, there was maybe a lack of control that you felt around your decisions and maybe the environment you were in. And I feel like the idea of control, centralized control, and then the decentralized trust is also a massive part of this book, which dovetails well with what we're talking about internationally. People maybe not feeling like the countries where they live allow them to own things. Or there was the story, and once again, I'm going to confuse some of the narratives, but it was somebody's grandparent who had land in, maybe it was Poland? And then, no, it was in Ukraine, Poland, Ukraine, or Russia, and I should not confuse those, but the bottom line was overnight when they went back post the war, their land had been carved out and now it was part of another country. 
And so they kind of can see their land, but they can't access it. And so that feeling of like, I have no control over things, which I think ties into ownership. And so looking at ownership and looking at, you know, the ideas of control and, and, and obviously the narrative of Bitcoin, how are you, and I guess I'll tie Lee in here as, as your partner, how are you guys starting to talk about Bitcoin from like even a 30,000 foot kind of a philosophical level with your children, knowing that maybe your childhood, you didn't feel like you had control over certain things. And now you're like, no, we're not going back to that. So how do I, you know, inculcate these new ideas, maybe using Bitcoin as a framework to talk about a new world? That's such a great question because we do, we have three daughters um, and they're all in elementary ages. And so they are asking questions. They, you know, had saw my book around the house and were asking questions about it. And obviously they know that Lee talks about Bitcoin all the time and people ask him about it when they're around. So they hear the word, they kind of understand it. And we have some of the children's books that um, other authors have written, which are great. Um, but I think there's a balance there, right? You don't want to swing so hard the other way that there are no rules. There are no, uh, there's no structure um, because I feel like children thrive off of being challenged. Um, they don't thrive off of being controlled. So that's where you have to balance it. It's like, you want to give them a job. You want to see how they um, handle it. And Lee and I are still learning. We don't, we still don't know what parenting is. Like we're, we're almost uh, eight, nine years in and we're still figuring it out. But um, I think Bitcoin is a tool to teach them that they can really, they can choose where they invest. They don't have to um, necessarily opt into the legacy financial system in the broad term of like, if they want to save in Bitcoin, if they want to buy a house with Bitcoin, um, if they want to talk about it or use it, or, you know, if they want to open up their own business and, and uh, accept Bitcoin as a payment, like they can do all those things. And it's a different type of money than it is with fiat. Um, I don't want to dog too much on government because I am I've, I'm pro government. I think it serves a very wonderful, useful purpose. Um, I'm not uh, you know I'm not anti-government, but I do feel like there are certain things that are just so far overreached. It is ridiculous. Um, and I mean, the hot topic right now is UK putting people in prison for posting memes, and I just think. How did, we, how did we get there? And I know that that's not in America, but like we're not that far off and I can see it happening. And there are things that people go to jail for that are just absolutely absurd. So um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's just a tool that we use as one thing to talk about with our kids. It's not like, we don't have like the Bitcoin white paper hanging on our wall, but <laughs> so we'll talk about it if anybody wants to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say, but do you though? No, you know, but do we you? really don't. Yeah. <laughs> I I love what you said about Bitcoin being a tool because I think at the end of the day, that's kind of the best way to think about it. I, I think about it as a hammer all the time. A hammer could be a deadly weapon in the sense that if used not for its intended purpose, it could be really dangerous, but a hammer can also build a house. You know, if you're stuck on an island, you would love a hammer. Yeah, you can use a rock here, but there's nothing like the swing of a hammer to, to put a couple things together. And Margo, uh, I don't know if she goes by Pies or Paez. She says, yeah, Bitcoin is a technology. It can do good things. It can do bad things. What we decide to do with it is what determines its positive or negative effects on the planet and humanity, which builds off that idea that, yeah, Bitcoin is just a tool. And I believe if I could shout out Margo, Margo is one of the people that I was able to meet, even though I was kind of like, a little awestruck when I met you because I was like, oh my gosh, a Bitcoin out there. And But she was one of the people at Bitcoin Nashville who I was able to kind of talk with, shake her hand and, you know, and then she signed the book, which is great. And she said, Bitcoin is for anyone who needs it, Margo. So Margo, shout out to you. Thank you for, for signing the book. You don't have the white paper up in your house. Totally understandable. I was reading this book and I'm thinking to myself from my own experience someone who creates podcasts with people from around the world talking about Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin. And I ask myself all the time, like, when are my friends going to really listen to this podcast? You know, because as a content creator, one of the loneliest parts of it, or even as an author, which is a content creator, some of your closest friends may not get what you're up to. And I wanted to read something else out here to kind of tie this idea in from Katie, uh, 
on uh, Nina. Once again, I'm yeah. not sure on pronunciation. And she says, uh, it's a, you know, the, the question you had was, how do you typically respond to those who are dismissive of Bitcoin, especially those close to you? And she says, I don't recall a single close friend or family member who would dismiss Bitcoin after I gave them the pitch. My Russian friends and relatives are preconditioned to understand Bitcoin after all the experiences they've gone through. And all my other friends came from the Bitcoin community, so it's been easy. When I read that, I was like, you know what? You are so lucky because that has not been my experience. And so what I wanted to ask you is like of your friends, your high school friends, your college friends, maybe the friends you grew up with, how many of them have read this? How many of them have kind of by osmosis because they see you as a part of their chosen family have kind of by osmosis gotten pulled into Bitcoin? Um, I would say a handful, not very many. And I totally respect that. Bitcoin is so weird. You know, it's just so <laughs> far fetched. It's so out there um, that I don't blame anyone who's like, I don't like, I'm really happy you wrote a book, but like, I don't want to read it. It's like, that's okay. Um, I will say that it has been really interesting since really 2022, last year to um, with inflation just spiking. Um, a lot of my friends who are moms um, have kind of reached out because they're like, okay, we know that you're into Bitcoin and we know that like the inflation is really high and like, you don't, you know, like what's, what's the connection there? What are you talking, like, what are you trying, what's your whole thing? And so that's been kind of cool to see very random people that I've known um, more of an acquaintance kind of uh, become more like closer friends because they understand what Bitcoin is about. They see the use for it. Um, and so that's been kind of fun to build like a, not a, a whole community here, but like it's just a different type of uh, group of people who are moms and they're like, hey, we need to like learn more about this. And yeah, so that's been kind of fun. But back to your original question, um, like, do you, do I identify as an author? I think that's where it is hard is because the people that I see day to day, like most of them don't know I even wrote a book, you know what I mean? So that's why it's hard to be like, yeah, I'm an author. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you 100%. Yeah. It goes back to some of the things I said about being a quote podcaster. It's not even for me from like a imposter syndrome. I just think that when people think of podcasters, for example, they think of Joe Rogan. That's like who people think about. And I don't have a million dollar studio in Austin, Texas. And right. I haven't been doing this as long. You know, he's been like podcasting since like for like 15 years or something. So, um, you know, it's, I don't know. It's building on what you just said though, about inflation. One of the first things from the first chapter or one of the first chapters, uh, Natalie Brunel, she says, you know, every year it gets more and more difficult to afford a home, a college education and retirement. The rich get richer, the poor get poor. And we're all working harder for currencies that are worth less and less. This isn't a natural phenomenon of our existence. It is the synthetic outcome of the state monopoly on money. And it impacts every aspects, every aspect, excuse me, of our lives. And this was a sentiment that was kind of also felt throughout the book of people being like, you know, to go to Lynn Alton's book, which is, I think, Broken Money, the money seems broken. Um, in your personal journey with Bitcoin, has that been a part, you know, how much of has that been a part of? Because I think it's, it's, a, it's a certain sliver for different people, but how much has that been a part of your experience? Yeah, so um, I originally heard about Bitcoin from a friend of mine, like in 2013 or before, and I just thought, okay, that's a hoax, that's whatever. And then fast <laughs> forward to when Lee started working on his dissertation, Anyway, it just, it started kind of making more sense in around 2020. I started reading more. Someone gave me the Bitcoin standard. Um, also, Lee was working from home. And so I overheard a bunch of calls because our house is like, you can hear everything wherever you are. Um, and so that's kind of when it started to make more sense in that, hey, it's not just some random investment that my husband does. It's actually a different type of protocol. Like it's completely separate from everything else. And I think that's kind of where it started to make sense is because I just thought like our money thing is so tight and trying to figure out like, you know, what are we going to do when like just schools and extracurricular activities for the kids and like just different things like money goes so fast. And so to find this, um, you know, investment, non-investment, however you want to phrase it, is that's like completely separate was really eye-opening for me. Um, 
just to see that. And originally we had set a goal, like we're going to, you know, when we get to this amount, we're like when Bitcoin gets to this amount, we're going to do this. And then when like whatever, I don't remember when it like peaked, but when it did, I was like, no, 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 no. We're not like, we're holding it. This is not, this is not just money that you use for things that you would spend money on. This is something that is useful for way more than that. And so, yeah, that's kind of where it made sense. I love that you just said that. And that, you know, at the Bitcoin conference, which you and I were able to meet, I'll probably throw that photo up. I am totally cheesing, totally excited to be there. Uh, you're also wearing a compass mining hat, which is kind of cool. It's a great hat. At the yeah. Great hat, the trucker hat. <laughs> at the Bitcoin conference, it was actually something that Michael Saylor said. I don't know if you were able to catch his um, keynote, but one of the last things he said was essentially anything that people buy that they don't need, basically all the wants, right? Mm -hmm. Basically 80% of the stuff people buy on Amazon because they're like, oh, that would be cool to put on my wall. Like I never knew I needed a fan that spritzed water over my head while I work from home or whatever the things are. He said basically okay. anything that you buy or people buy or consumers buy that are wants and not needs are going to be demonetized. Uh, those are the first things. And then he obviously goes into some of the other things that maybe we see as needs that could also be demonetized by Bitcoin's rise which kind of ties into a little, a little bit of what you're talking about. Thinking about the financial education side of Bitcoin, how has that been for you? And I find that the more I podcast, the more I learn. Selfishly, I started this in the middle of the pandemic podcasting because I just wanted to talk to more cool people. And so with writing the book, and by the way, the book is laid out where there's basically really good information about Bitcoin, a part of Bitcoin, and then there's a story of a woman who's in Bitcoin who, pardon my Spanish, is kicking ass. And so in the writing of the book, what were you learning about Bitcoin? Because the story in my head is that there's no way you didn't also learn while writing this book uh, about Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. No, I learned so much. And I read, I had already read a bunch of books, but I read so many more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think anything from like the intricacies of Bitcoin mining is something that's always been hard for me to understand. Um, inventing Bitcoin helped me understand a lot. And then just kind of touching points with other books uh, was really, really helpful. I mean, oh my gosh, so many topics I would just like read and read and read, do online searches, try to listen to as many podcasts as I could. Yeah, open source code. Like I, I knew off the top of my head what that was, but then like actually diving in on what like it isn't was really eye opening to me. Um, I mean, oh my gosh, Bitcoin addresses again. Like I kind of knew what it was, not not in the uh, not to the level that I wanted to. I mean, all kinds of different things. Yeah, I learned a ton, <laughs> and I'm still learning. <laughs> Yeah, because I thought you did a really good job of breaking down all of the concepts around Bitcoin, the decentralization, the idea of a blockchain, the idea of permissionless, some of these bigger philosophical things that I think people take for granted, but having to actually explain them chapter by chapter, I thought you did a really good job. And this is a book that beyond obviously the gender inclusion, which I think we should really start to talk about and as that being a focus of the book it's kind of a great primer of just what is Bitcoin. You know, I felt like if you stripped away the narratives, which are obviously so important, you could have a 30 to 40 page book. That's just like, understand Bitcoin in an hour, you know, here you go, boom, you know, support. And then all the money goes to like one of the nonprofits that you highlight, which are nonprofits around the world focusing on inclusion. Cause I, I really, there's so many things here that, you shared that I hear from my female friends, uh, my college friends, my just friends from life who are like, they know I'm in Bitcoin. But before they can even think about Bitcoin, they think it's scary. They think it's scammy, all the things you've listed. But it feels like, and this is what has been said to me, if a woman, for example, isn't used to going to the gym, it's as nerve wracking for her. And I'm working with one of my best friends right now. And she'd be mad that I'm calling her out on a podcast, <laughs> but she knows she needs to go to the gym, but she's like, it's so intimidating to go into the gym. And I'm like, can come with me. It's fine. We'll walk in. Uh, we'll hang out. You know, we can, you can do some weights. You can do some cardio. You can go to the, go to the pool. I'm there. I know everyone it's good, but I've been going to the gym since I was in college and I've always been an athlete, but for her, it's so 
anxiety provoking to go into the gym. And I feel like I get that same feeling. And I've been told that this analogy that it's like going into a gym as a female where you just don't maybe feel like welcome. You don't feel comfortable all not from something that someone said, but because you look around the room and you don't see anyone like you. And that was resonated all throughout. So I wanted to ask this, this question specifically, if I think you went to your first conference with, with Lee, which is a great person to go with because he's so connected. If it weren't for Lee, would you have ever gone alone? Oh, a hundred percent. No, I actually only went to that conference because I was seeing a friend. The conference was at A&M and I was meeting up with a friend and, but I had some extra time. So I was like, I'll just pop into a session and the rest is history. <laughs> but yeah, no, a hundred percent. The gym analogy is a very good way to explain what it feels like. Um, I've brought several different friends to meetups over the years um, who have just mentioned like an interest in Bitcoin. But I, and I say this in my book, I wouldn't go to a meetup alone. Um, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even recommend that. It's great to take somebody with you, even if they don't care at all about Bitcoin at all. Yeah. Now I really want you to qualify something because this word is now a politicized word in America. You call Bitcoiners weird. And I'm the first to agree with that 100,000%. Yes. What do you mean by Bitcoiners are weird? And you, you've touched a little bit, but like, you know, out of the box or kind of different. But for you, like, what do you mean by Bitcoiners are weird? I just mean like off the beaten path a little bit. Like you're either curious enough to question the status quo or you're um, fed up or you've been through something that's very challenging and you realize this, there's got to be other options. Um, yeah, just kind of a little bit different. Um, I don't let my kids use the word weird, so I shouldn't say it either. But um, I mean, I just don't know how to describe it. Like it's, it's weird in the best way possible. Okay, cool. Yeah. I cuz cuz when I think of weird, I think of within the Bitcoin context. Yeah. I think of unique. Yes. Like one of ones. And obviously every human being is a one of one, but I feel like with Bitcoin especially, there's people from all different walks of life and you outline it in this book. Every you know, these women would have never come together under a book if it weren't for Bitcoin because they're all doing such different things. And something else that I wanted to ask since we met at the Bitcoin conference was like, okay, how was that experience for you? I mean, when I saw you, you were with other people who were highlighted in the book, you were hanging out with Lee, but overall, what was your take of the conference? Cause I have to admit, this was the first Bitcoin only conference I've, I've been to. I've been to crypto conferences, but never Bitcoin conferences. I actually met Lee at consensus, I believe consensus in September of 2023. That's where I first met Lee at an event that the Texas Blockchain Council was actually putting on. But for you, how was your experience? Um, I, you know, I'm sure you saw the lines, as you call out in the book, of massive lines for men to go to the bathroom and the women had like the express pass, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's not as many women. But uh, how was the conference for you? Um, yes, yeah, so Nashville um, for the Bitcoin Magazine conference had a very unique vibe to me for from my perspective. Um, I mean don't even really need to mention the fact that like the whole conference was centered around Trump coming to speak, which was, you know, cool in its own right. I totally recognize that that's a very big deal. Um, but I think in some ways it took away from the overall picture of like what Bitcoin is about. Um, and, but that may not have been the case. I don't, that's just kind of my perspective. And um, I feel like last year in Miami, it had a really great type of vibe of like, everyone was really hyped. It was a tough market. Everyone's kind of there, like just trying to make it, you know, trying to bounce ideas around, think outside the box even more than usual. Um, and so in Nashville in and of itself is way more, um, you know, conservative as a, I don't know, I don't know, maybe the city's not, but like, I feel like Tennessee as a whole is way more conservative than uh, at least Miami. So, it was just different and, uh, you know, but not in like a, not in a bad way or in even a good way. It's just like a different type of feel. And I think that's good because Bitcoin really does draw from a massive, um, you know, group of people. Like it's not gonna, it's not just conservatives. It's not just progressives. It's not, you know, Southerners or whatever. Like it really does, uh, 
connect with a lot of different kinds of people. Um, and it was cool because some of the women that came to the book signing event, some would identify more as progressive and some would identify as very conservative. And we were all talking and not having a wonderful time. And I just kept thinking about that because um, like you don't come across that many uh, topics that bring people together. And once you really dive in and understand what Bitcoin is about, it really does bring people together. So yeah, it was, yeah, I thought it was a great conference. I felt the same way and I'm glad that I wasn't the only one. And many people I've spoken to said similar things that it's like, you know, outside of industry day, you had Friday and Saturday, which are kind of like the open days where people are going to come through. And it's really more of like a kind of open door house party about Bitcoin. The fact that one of those days was essentially dominated by Trump kind of, for me, partisaned the conference in a world where it's not even bipartisan. It's just nonpartisan. It's just money and it's just technology. And something that Elliot David said, who actually came on um, our most recent episode, he said, Bitcoin isn't left or right, it's forward. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was great. And I'm going to continue to quote him on that. I'm not sure if it's his quote, but that felt weird to me because all the other conferences I've been to that are around blockchain, that's, it's not like leave politics at the door. It just doesn't have anything to do with how this moves forward, I think, over a long enough period of time. So I I also felt the same. Um, of the people that are highlighted, the women in the book that are highlighted, how many of them were able to make it to the conference? There were probably six or seven that were there. Yeah. So a lot of them are international, and so they weren't going to you know, make it over to uh, Tennessee. But... Um, yeah, the ones that were there, it was great to see them, chat with them. Um, and a lot of them are busy building their businesses, so they weren't able to come by the booth or whatever, and that's totally fine. Um, I just put it out there for anyone who had the time to stop by. Yeah, I want to shout out Perry Ann Boring. She was the first person on this podcast with Compass that I was able to talk to, and she was gracious enough to give me her time. So shout out Perry Ann Boring. She also signed the book, which was really great. And Perry Ann, as well as I think... Caitlin Long, Lynn Alden, I believe Perry, yeah, Perry Ann has a more traditional finance background. And then I know she got into journalism and was one of the first people to cover Bitcoin. But there's good amount of people in the book who were more TradFi, and then they kind of fell into the Bitcoin rabbit hole. How, like, where... I'm not even sure the question I have, but I just think that that's kind of like a, a thread. And so... When you meet people in Bitcoin, is that something that you also see as a common thread when they were like, yeah, I was trading stocks or I was you know, doing equities or I was working uh, with the government as actually Perry Ann was. Do you see that thread? Is that another common thread that you feel like was kind of prominent throughout the book? Yeah, I would say for sure it is. It's almost like when you meet people though, and they're like, embarrassed to say like, oh, I worked in TradFi, you know, it's like, hey, don't, <laughs> don't know because you made it out or like, hey, you're making it better because you're still there. Um, you know, I think everybody needs to just kind of like own where they're at. And I'm telling this to myself too. Like you just, you come to Bitcoin with what you can help with and you do your best and you, you know, try to make the world better. That's all you can do. But yeah, no, for sure. It's definitely a funny experience to hear people like say, I was in TradFi, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> That's, that's been my experience. If someone coming from banking, they like yeah. whisper it, yeah. you know, like, yeah, I was in banking, but now I'm in Bitcoin. And like, you can actually hear the inflection in their voice. Um, for you writing this book, I want to jump into the inclusion part, right? Which is the, one of the most important threads. It's one of the questions that you ask of every single person, you know, why is it important to close the gender gap? And I guess for that, I'll go ahead and read something here from Alana, um, media via Diaz. She says, you know, we need all kinds of people to root for financial sovereignty. And that starts with conversations around the dinner table that mothers are very often responsible for leading. Whether a woman is financially independent or supporting her partner is taking on their responsibility for the family. Women understanding the importance of Bitcoin means more support for more support of other women, people in their community, and most importantly, their families. And I could read on and on because each one has an amazing quote. But for you, if I ask you that same question, you know, why do you feel like it's important to, to kind of close the gender gap in Bitcoin? Um, I feel very strongly about this because I feel like when I understood Bitcoin and the purpose behind it and all the things that it could accomplish, it really changed how I viewed just 
how I bought things. And women, especially in the U.S., account for like over 80% of purchasing power, whether or not they, you know, they themselves earn that money, but they spend that money. And so I just feel like with all of the, you know, marketing thrown at, um, I don't know, especially in the U.S., I'm just talking about the U.S. here, but it's, it might be more global. Um, marketing is just eating us alive. Um, and it's more than that. It's like we're always looking for the next thing. We're always looking for something to, you know, get excited about for that dopamine hit to just make us feel a little bit better about whatever happened that day. And so I really just feel like Bitcoin is kind of a, a like the long time preference type of mindset is so important. And that's where I feel like women could really change um, the narrative about just how you spend your money and why it matters what you, you know, you do vote with your dollar. And if more women can get involved, I feel like it would really help close the partisan gap too in politics. Um, there's, you know, more and more a very big gap between white males or really just males in general and then women in general voting. And that's not helpful for literally anyone. And so I just think Bitcoin could be one of those things that kind of helps bring people together, kind of uh, align a lot of um, uh, just goals, I think, for the next generation. Uh, generation Alpha is, you know, coming up fast and they are going to they are going to be so much more intense than than anything we've ever seen. And so I think it's uh, very, very important to close the gender gap in that way. I'm really not like a you know, feminists and that women need to rule the world and, and do everything. I think men and women are equal and need to be treated equally instead of um, there being such a big gap. It's one of the things in your book, which was kind of like, I think every book you read, there's the Pareto principle, right? So you're going to get 20% of the like juice from the book uh, or 80% of the juice from the book, only from like the 20% of the pages. And there's a quote here that really, for me, something that I need to think about more. So I want to first thank you for putting the book together. And I believe the quote, I was just looking to find this as you were talking because it totally resonated. Uh, Summer Mersinger, she says, again, when asked the question about the gender gap, she says, again, with a mostly even evenly split population, lopsided participation by one gender is very likely a symptom of a more serious underlying condition, which you've even talked about now. You're talking about, you know, even taking part of our democratic process that there's more men voting potentially. And then she says, looking back once again to the history, uh, open outcry and the derivatives, it took several decades before the first woman traded futures in the pits during the 1960s. We can and must approve this time around. And, and I want to find the other quote, and I don't know if I can find it now because I'm on mic and under pressure, <laughs> but there was another quote that kind of resonated this, that like, it took a long time, but we can do better, A. Eh? It was talking about male content creators and it said, how many male content creators, and I felt like I was being yelled at, and that's fine. <laughs> how many male content creators are creating content for themselves and not creating content for people that maybe don't look like them, maybe don't think like them, maybe have a different gender, et cetera, et cetera. So that was something that I kind of sat with and it's made me think kind of more about that. So I, want, I wanted to thank you on that. And I, I, I just wonder... I wonder what it's going to, you know, if there's going to be a moment where like, or what do you think is the moment where women are kind of like, okay, I feel comfortable in Bitcoin. If we go back to the gym analogy, when is the moment when it's like, okay, I feel comfortable enough to try to jump and jump in the gym. Um, I think it's almost a two sided. There's a two sided answer to that because I feel like the gym is for everyone. Just get yourself in the gym, you know, like it doesn't matter. <laughs> Nobody's looking at you. They are thinking about themselves. So mm -hmm. there's that aspect of it that I feel very strongly about, like, just go like, and I, I wouldn't have done it. So I get it. But also there are enough women now where you're not going to be the only one probably. So, you know, there's that. And then the other side of it is the more women in the space, um, like Natalie Brunel has done a really wonderful job of making the Bitcoin conference itself more like feminine by having the women's brunch or different side events that are like easy to go to, you know, to kind of like make your first event or whatever. Um, and so the more women in the space, the more women will come and hang out and not feel quite as lonely. 
I was not there. So now I'll ask, how was the women's brunch at the conference in Nashville? You know, it's funny. There were actually a lot of men there. So it's, I think it's for everyone. <laughs> but uh, it was see, there awesome. you, see, there you go. Yeah. There you go. See, I, but my assumption is I'm not, my assumption is I can't go. <laughs> And it's that's probably a similar, as, yeah, yeah. Ex- okay, so there we go, because it's probably the exact same assumption that like my like best friend has. She's like, oh, I can't go to the gym. I'm not invited. Yeah, you know. And it's like, no, it's for everyone. Okay, this is good. I'm glad that was on mic. I'm. I will be at the brunch next year. How about that? That's that's something I need to do. <laughs> yeah. I honestly just assumed that I wasn't able to go because I saw, I forget who somebody posted. Um, that they were going and I saw some pictures and I was just like, Oh, okay, cool. Whatever, you know, but yeah. now next year I'll need to go. One of the questions I had about the book specifically is where people can get it. And also, uh, cause I, I believe I, I got my, my copy off Amazon. And then do you have the demographics? Do we know if more women are buying this, if more men are buying this? I wish I did. Um, but no, it's only on Amazon and they don't collect I'm sure they do collect that data, but I do not get that data. So, um, yeah, that would be very interesting to know, but we were going to try to get it into like more brick and mortar stores, but it's honestly just way more cost efficient to just put on Amazon and pretty much anyone can order it. So that's great. (laughs) I will be sure to leave that link in the descriptions. That way people can go check it out. And now that you're an author, no pressure, What's the next book? I've talked to you and I'm going to put this on mic. I've talked to you about getting this translated into other languages. And I know that it took Saifedean some time with the Bitcoin standard, but he now has that thing in like 30 plus languages. And so maybe it will take you some time, but know Mm -hmm. that when it's ready in Spanish, I have a massive network in Latin America and they will dive into this head first. So... You know, what's really interesting is there was a woman at the brunch um, who came up to me and was like, hey, I really want to order your book. But she didn't. I only had Venmo or Lightning um, or you could order on Amazon and she didn't have any of those. And then she tried to pull it up on Amazon. And it wouldn't deliver to where she lives in Mexico City. So I was like, OK, here, take the book because you should have it if you want it. Like if you're going to read it, then please take it. It's my gift to you. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting that that was the case. So. Um, I would love to get it translated into another language. If someone, um, you know, if, if there's people out there that could use it, that would read it and that, you know, I don't want to go so far as to say need it, but I'm happy to provide that. I need to just kind of look into the you know cost of it, kind of what that takes to translate it. I'm sure it's not all that difficult now with, um, you know, AI, all that, but, um, do that and, uh, get it out to people who want to read it. We will talk offline about this because I have a connection. My mentor from undergrad is probably the foremost author writing around about Colombia in English. And then he also, once they're in English, he gets them translated into Spanish. And he normally co-authors the books actually with a professor down in Bogota. So we could talk about that. I'm sure that they have really good resources for you. And I have many resources because I would just love... This is me being selfish again. I'm sorry, but I would love to get it into Spanish because there's a big network down there that will see a lot of interest in there. And there's also a lot of women in Latin America that are making very big moves when it comes to crypto and Bitcoin. And I think that this also goes back to some of the things we said maybe at the beginning of the episode, which is like for us, maybe it's a long, a long time horizon um, tool. But for people down there, it's like, no, I just need to hold my purchasing power for three months so I can buy that sofa. Because if I keep it in the peso, I just don't know what's going to happen. So um, we can talk more about that. But besides getting it translated into all of the languages of the world, are you thinking about a second edition? What's next for you as far as uh, being an author? Yeah, there are a couple different projects in the works. I'm excited to talk more about those in the coming weeks. Um, hopefully not months. Hopefully it won't take that long. But uh, there is a second edition possibility, but I'm not totally sure if it's going to come together. It might, or it might just be a while before uh, we get it together, but I would love to focus on different regions, um, globally and kind of highlighting women who are really developing businesses in that specific country or, um, continent even, I guess. But, um, but I think just, that would be really cool to make it more specific to the women, uh, in different areas. You've kind of read my mind and I had a question here, which was like, 
now that you've highlighted all of, not all of, but many of the women who are making big strides in Bitcoin around the world, is there a particular place you would like to visit to kind of go see how the economy works, how things work? I don't know if you've already been down to El Salvador, because obviously like what's going on there with it being a sovereign currency is kind of crazy, but maybe outside of El Salvador, because that's kind of low hanging fruit. I don't want to give you too of an <laughs> easy question. Is there a place where you're like, I really want to go there to see how this closed circular economy is working or just any place, any of the, you know, any, any of the women you highlighted here who are running crazy cool nonprofits, uh, obviously of money where no object and you could just right. hop on your jet and take Lee and the kids and go, but you know, where, where would you like to go and check out? Yeah, there's definitely the um, African Bitcoin conference has always just fascinated me because of everything that Bitcoin is helping uh, just make happen in different African countries. Um, so it's been in Ghana the last two years. And this year, I want to say it's in Kenya. And um, I mean, obviously, like Nigeria has just been like totally turned over with the use of the their CBDC and trying to ban Bitcoin. Um, I just feel like, like, yeah, that's why Bitcoin was, hopefully that's why Bitcoin was created. I know it has tons of uses, but like, that's, that's who really can use it right now. That's where it's helping the most. Um, so I would love to focus on, you know, a handful of African countries to kind of highlight what's going on. But again, I don't know if that's going to be that beneficial. I don't know. I mean, they don't need me for sure, but I just feel like it could be so interesting to bring that, um, not only to other women who live in African countries who haven't heard about Bitcoin yet, but also to the U S to kind of maybe create some type of, um, just education of like, Hey, think outside the box of what Bitcoin can really do. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Th that's for me as someone who lives most of his time in South America and who is a dual citizen in Colombia, that for me was something that I found really special about this book because it was not only a book that maybe orange pills you, but it's a book that will take you if you're already in Bitcoin to realize that it's much bigger than the 48 contiguous States of the United States. This is solving problems around the world. And I really felt like it was a kind of a tour around the map of projects that are happening and getting off the ground. So I want to thank you for that. That was really cool. And I, I would also say they may not need you, but if you compile those stories and you bring those stories back to the U.S., every single nation is represented in every single major city in this country, which is a really cool thing. You know, you can get food from all over the world and basically every major city. So there's someone there who's like, oh, either my parents are from there or my grandparents are from there. And I didn't realize that they're using Bitcoin. That's really cool. Uh, and then they may start to see themselves within the solution that has been presented globally. They may see it more locally. So I think that there's real value in that. And I want to ask, uh, obviously, I'll put the link for the book in the description, but if people want to reach out to you because they're like, Becca, this is awesome, or they're like, Becca, I am doing something in Africa, or I'm doing something down in Peru, or I'm doing something you know, around the world, and I want to be a part of that second book, where could they find you? I feel like you're on X and LinkedIn, but where's the best place? Yeah, probably LinkedIn. Uh, send me a message on there um, or X, but sometimes X, there's just a lot of spam, I feel like. Um, so LinkedIn's probably better. And yes, I would say please reach out because I would love to hear from different women who you know are interested in Bitcoin who are already using it and just don't know how to like get into a network. I would love to help them get more connected. Amazing. I will put your LinkedIn in the uh, episode description and I want to thank you for taking the time to hop on uh, yeah. the episode today. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please subscribe. Follow us at Compass Mining on X, which was Twitter. LinkedIn and YouTube. And Becca, thank you once again. And I'm sure I'll see you. Uh, maybe I think the Texas Blockchain Council, I may be up there. I think that's in November. That may be the next time we might cross paths IRL. But at any rate, thank you for hopping on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And you're doing such a great job with your podcast. So keep it up. Thanks. Thanks.